Okay. So welcome everyone and thanks for joining us. Um, good good evening in the UK, good morning in Australia and we are at uh, episode number 83 um, and we're really excited to welcome uh, Anna Boniface uh, to join us. Thanks for joining us Anna. Um, episode uh, 83 is Relative Energy Deficiency in Sport or Red S or REDS which we will be uh, abbreviating it to for the rest of this this uh, this uh, episode and forgive me if I keep looking down at my notes it's a topic I'm not particularly strong on myself not I'm, I'm not as strong as I, I need to be or want to be so I've, I've made extensive notes and, and prepared hopefully well for this so um, um, Anna it comes to us with a wealth of experience as a physiotherapist um, who lectures um, and lectured extensively uh, and written uh, in the BJSM amongst other places on this topic. Uh, we'll add some links to some of these resources in the in the notes at the end, um, but also as an athlete, uh, a, a, a rather sp special athlete when I look at her times, and an athlete who um, has experienced Red S on, on the athlete side of things as well, which we'll, we'll, we'll lean into a bit as we go on as well. So um, we'll start straight from the the sort of the the i guess the the infancy of, of this and we'll just ask you first off anna uh, to describe to our to us and our listeners what what is red s how is it best defined so reds is this um fairly new definition um that evolved from a consensus by the ioc in um, 2014 and it's very much evolved from what people might be a bit more familiar with as the female athlete triad and I'll go back to that in a little bit more about why it has evolved. But what it is, is this sort of concept of low energy availability. So you've got your normal life processes. So, for example, being able to breathe, lie down, do absolutely nothing. And then you then have your exercise. And what low energy availability is, it's not meeting that sort of energy demand. So you're then in this energy imbalance as such you've not got enough energy requirements to you know do normal life processes so this tends to be in the circumstance with our athletic population or our sporty population when they are doing too much training and not getting enough fuel in the body to to, to fuel normal life, life processes so what tends to happen, I like to use this analogy just to make it really simple, is that you have your iPhone and you know, you go into that low battery mode, that 20%, you haven't got enough sort of battery life to, 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 to continue fueling for the rest of the day. So it goes into this battery power saving mode. And what it does is it switches off non-essential non apps, doesn't it? So that's kind of what the, the, the body does. When you're in the state of low energy availability, you've not got enough energy, you switch off non-essential life processes. So this might be hormonal regulation, it might be adapting to um, performance, it we might be your menstrual cycle, and there's an array of multiple systems it starts to downregulate in a way to survive almost. The body's very primitive, so it will always prioritize movement. So at that time it's prioritizing, you know, your training at the time, that's that movement. Um, so that's sort of it in a, in a nutshell. So the reason why it might have expanded from the female athlete triad, so I think people might be more familiar with that in the sense that it was this triad that female athletes um, have disordered eating at the top, which results in amenorrhea, so lack of periods, and then um, issues of bone density, so reduced bone mineral density. Now that is still very much part of REDS or relative energy deficiency in sport. And it's very much evolved from that, that process, that, that, that female athlete triad. And the reason why it has expanded is firstly, we know that it doesn't just affect females. It very much affects men too. And I think if someone came into clinic and go, oh, I think you're suffering from a female athlete triad to a bloke, they're not gonna take you very seriously. So I think it's important that there is this new definition. But one of the most important reasons why it has sort of evolved is that we're now understanding that it actually affects multiple systems and also performance impairments as well. So just to touch on, first of all, that the systems it affects, it affects multiple systems. So the one that jumps out and the one that it's very much associated with is that, um, that, that bone density issue. So a lot of the time we associate it with those stress fractures. So that we know we know that you know someone in low energy availability they're going to have a reduced burn bone turnover so bone mineral density is really affected and i've been shocked through my work in seeing 
quite how detrimental the bone health becomes in really young athletes. Um, so a lot of the reason why the bone density is reduced is not necessarily due to sort of vitamin D deficiency. It's not necessarily due to biomechanics. It's actually due to your hormone effect. And this is one of the big, big things that happens in reds is you get this endocrine effect where your hormones, your, your sex hormones are downregulated. So again, if we kind of use an analogy, if you're in your body's interpreting a drought, for example, that there's not enough fuel to go around, why is it going to produce sex hormones? Because it's not going to want to produce because there's not enough fuel to go around. That's what it sort of interprets. So your, your, your sex hormones get downregulated. So that's like your estrogen, your testosterone. And that's really, really important for your bone health and also for a lot of other different things too. So your endocrine system gets really affected. Your metabolic system, and this is the harsh irony of REDS, is your metabolism actually is really affected and actually you hold more body fat because it's trying to conserve energy and you can kind of mess up your metabolic system quite a lot, which sort of goes against the reasons why people might go into an energy deficit. You then get cardiovascular um, issues too. So we know that estrogen is quite protective, for example, in regards to cardiovascular health. So you can get more kind of atherosclerosis plaque. And also if someone is being more on the eating disorder side of this, they can have issues with kind of electrolyte disturbances, which will affect their heart rhythms, etc. You've then got like immune function, you've got um, growth and development in your in your younger athletes. Gastro issues is a really common thing. So things like um, constipation, um, diarrhea, um, as it affects your gut health. And then you've then got, um, for example, your, your blood. So a lot of people will have sort of these other little signs to look out for, such as low iron, low, like low in their kind of minerals on their bloods and things like that. So it's very much multiple systems. The female athlete child also doesn't even touch on the way that affects performance. So, you know, you again, hormones are very much in charge of adaptation. And if your hormones are kind of downregulated, you're not going to be adapting to training. If we look at what most people use for performance enhancing drugs, I'm, I'm not, you know, saying that that's the, the way to go. But I'm just saying that, you know, people often don't with testosterone and things like that because hormones are so important for adaptation and for sort of building muscle strength, for allowing us to recover better. So if those hormones are less, we're not going to get that adaptation. So we're not going to recover properly. We're not going to be able to kind of rebuild our muscles. We're not going to be kind of getting those endurance endurance changes. Our performance is very much going to be impaired and coordination as well is going to be very much affected. Um, and then it's going to have a direct effect, effect on our mood. So I don't know if anyone's ever experienced that feeling of being hangry. <laughs> um, when they're really, really hungry, but that's something that really gets impaired. So people will get depression, irritability, you know, carbs make us happy. So if you're not having enough carbohydrates, it's very much going to affect your mood. So it affects so many different things. I think it's really important to be aware of all the other systems that affects because sometimes someone might present in clinic and they might not have a stress fracture, but they still might be reds. And it's about looking at those other little subtle things of other systems that might be affected at the time. Yeah, and I think it's so important uh, for us to hear just how just how vast the effects are across multiple systems of the body. Because what I hear there are little clues into how we can, um, you know, the clinical gems as to how we can perhaps identify the the patient sitting in front of us that may be may be suffering from this. So, uh, what I want our audience to take home from this um, is the things to look for, the things to ask. And I think that, that we're probably going to have to lean back on some of those things you've said to, to get there. One thing I just want to quickly touch on, you talk about the sort of the health, the health side of things and the performance side of things. Would it be right to assume that when we're talking about elite athletes in particular, the health side of things going wrong isn't necessarily something that bothers them. I've certainly heard elite athletes normalize the loss of a period. It's like it shows I'm tra it shows I'm training hard enough. But as soon as those health detriments start to become more apparent, that's when they're more likely to buy into to, to this process. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, I think at the end of the day, I mean, athletes not having periods is a really big red flag, and we will certainly go in go into that. Um, but I think at the end of the day, athletes, they don't, they don't care that they're not having periods. In fact, they probably think it's a good thing. I don't have to think about doing that. So 
in a way that your your buy-in really is going to be the fact that this is not going to help their performance. And I think what a lot of th unfortunately what a lot of things happen when people maybe lose a bit of weight or they have this brief period of time where they've they've started this sort of energy deficit. They will have a brief period of time where they maybe are performing better. And I'm particular this is very, very brief. And they may be a little bit deluded the fact that what they might have done has resulted in their increased performance. And it's just about trying to rationalize with them that that's, it's not sustainable. And eventually things will start to go wrong because it always does. And the performance effects that they're striving for won't then happen. And often what happens with these athletes, so most of the time, unfortunately, when they come to us, they've already sort of had that crash. But if maybe you're catching them early, a sort of a routine appointment, for example, you just pick up on it, or they haven't sort of had this full-blown injury, which is going to put them out for a long time. It's really hard to sort of persuade them when they're sort of feeling that they're, they're, going to, they're performing really, really well. But you notice they're not having their, their periods. They've got some niggles. This is happening. And you put the story together. So it's just sort of actually saying to them, actually, this is not a long-term effect, what you're doing now. Or if they have got injured, it's about really buying them into what they've done before is not sustainable. And they're actually going to have to take some time to reset their body to get that performance that they want. Because, you know, hormones are what adapt us to training. And if you've got low hormones because of this, you're not going to adapt and you're not going to have that consistency and that longevity that we need in sport in order to actually be successful. Perfect. And another point to quickly touch on, um, just because many of us may not see elite athletes in our clinic, but we're wrong to assume this is an elite athlete problem. I mean, any athlete, any any person doing any sport, um, if they've got if they're in that deficit, you know, and, and a lot of people will be, they'll be, you know, they'll be training hard and they'll be modifying their diet because of their fitness goals or their weight loss goals. Um, you don't have to be training at the volume and intensity of, of 70 miles a week elite athlete to get this. Is that a fair uh, comment? Yeah, I actually think it's probably more common in your amateur athlete, to be honest, like your kind of weekend warrior type of people. Those ones that are trying to balance, you know, having kids, you know, working full time, they're the ones that I think are probably more at risk. Um, and also, they're the ones that probably aren't having the education about it. They're not as supported as your sort of elite end. What well, are probably going to be having a lot more check-ins of medical professions. They're a lot more closely monitored. So I actually think it's going to be the most of them is sort of that amateur to sort of maybe semi-elite athlete. So they're going to be the ones that are the key ones. But I've had people through you know, a 40-year-old mum of three that's just started running all the way through to more of your elite end. So, you know, you you can just get people that are just new new runners and they're just going to the gym and things like that. So it does affect every, every kind of person that is exercising. So it's not to disregard, you know, your mum of three coming in who's only running, you know, 35 miles a week, for example. Yeah, perfect. And the last thing I wanted to touch on before we move on to the clinical questioning is... Um, Certainly, I was always guilty historically of thinking this is a problem uh, or if, if this is something that I should be thinking of, a flag will go up if someone sits in front of me and they look incredibly thin, incredibly underweight. Um, and certainly from, from listening to you speak previously on this, that, that isn't the case either. No, absolutely not. Like a lot of them will be maybe on that end, but not exclusively, 100% not. You know, you can even get people that you might think are completely a normal way or even maybe the upper end of normal and it's important just to question it because they might have had this sort of initial bout of weight loss further down the line but as I said that there's quite a, a, an adaptation to your metabolic system and to the point where your 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 body just clings on to, to, to body fat in regards of means of survival so it, it's not the thing that you should sort of base your clinical reasoning on it would be more on the the, the other things so I certainly wouldn't wouldn't rely on that as a as a factor. And also for someone as a measure of being recovered from it, I wouldn't have that as a as a benchmark or something for them to be aiming for, um, because it, it it's very yeah it just doesn't equal energy balance or any or low energy availability being restored. Perfect. So great. So just just because you've got someone sitting in front of you who doesn't look underweight and who isn't 
putting in massive mileage or isn't anywhere near elite doesn't mean to exclude this perfect let's get on to what what the things in in our clinic we we should be thinking about we should be asking so we're we're in a clinic we have a a, you know, a runner or a, someone you know someone who's um in, sitting in front of us what are the what are the key questions what are the things that we should probably be asking uh, in almost every assessment that we do yeah, I mean, this is one of the most things I get questioned about because it's actually really quite some difficult things you're going to be you're going to be asking. So I think you know, first of all, it's about just taking your clinical history, um, and particularly most of the time we do see things to do with bone health. So I would like to underpin looking at other things that might be sort of clues in regards to maybe it not being related to energy deficit. Um, and rads particularly. So just ask your kind of classic bone health questions. So you know, look at any genetic history of osteoporosis. You want to also look at, you know, is this person been in a weight bearing sports or if they've been in a non weight bearing sport since they were 12? If they've been in a pool since they were 12 years old and barely weight bearing, you know, you've got to think of their effect on bone density in that. So that early specialization is quite important in what sport they were doing. When did they start strengthening and conditioning? You know, is there this maybe a first stress fracture? Um, have they had other ones? Um, looking at things like links to Crohn's disease, because we know that has a, 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 an overlap with osteoporosis, things like that. Um, and steroid use, you know, if they've had a background of asthma, things, things like that. But I think what's really important with the past medical history and just sort of your history taking is looking at maybe those subtle signs that might be the other systems being affected. So have they got iron deficiency? Have they got anemia? Have they got, you know, irritable bowel syndrome or lots of gastro problems? Are they getting frequent coughs and colds? We also know that from an injury history perspective, it's not just sort of your, your bone health and your stress fractures. You know, it also has an effect on your tendon health. So has this person had recurrent, you know, um, tendinopathies, for example, or sort of those recurrent stress-related stress injuries? Um, I think that's sort of what you want to get from like a, a history perspective. Now, coming into the, the difficult questions, now for your female athletes, now this is going to be particularly difficult for males to talk about. And that's about the menstrual sort of status of your athlete. I think a lot of things people are now starting to become more aware of it. So I think for the best way to sort of approach it in regards to making it not feel really awkward is to say, okay, for you sort of your rehab, or for me just to understand about your injury, can you tell me a bit about your menstrual cycle? Because we know that we understand that through different phases of it, you're gonna adapt differently, for example. So that's the way I like to approach it, because I like to say, okay, so I know that I'm not gonna push your rehab on during you know, your, your phase that just before your period, because that's when you're maybe not gonna be adapting as well to sort of that. So that's kind of like how I like to sort of approach it in regards to, testing the waters a little bit. So the kind of questions you want to ask about menstrual history is, okay, when did they start their period? So for example, you might have a younger younger athlete who might not have even started their period. Now, primary amenorrhea, AKA not starting your period, is um, from the age of, of, of 16. Um, so if they haven't reached that by 16, then you, you, you're gonna to want to sort of, that's like your first red flag that they've not started. However, they might have started, and it might have then stopped, and that's secondary amenorrhea. So you sort of want to get an age of when they started, and then you want to maybe find out if they stopped. So the best question to approach this is saying, how many periods do you maybe have a year? Um, and we say that if there's, I think it's any less than eight, I think, is a bit of a, a red flag in saying that there's disruption to menstrual history or menstrual status. Um, so it's trying to find out a little bit about that. And sometimes they're going to be a bit coy about it, and they might not want to approach it. So you might have to dig a bit more and say, well, when was your last one? I know that um, Tom Goon, the running physio, he actually has um, a performer, like a, a questionnaire he gets people to fill in before they come into clinics. So he doesn't have to necessarily ask these questions, which is quite a good way around it. Another important thing to link into the menstrual kind of questioning is about the oral contraceptive pill, because I think that is almost like a get out of jail free, free card for people because they're like, well, I'm on the pill. I have a monthly bleed or I don't have periods because I'm on the pill. Now, if they're on the pill and they're having a monthly bleed, that is not a period, that's a withdrawal bleed, that is not an indication of their menstrual status. So that makes things even more tricky. And if they're not having their periods because they're on the contraceptive pill or the coil or whatever, 
you're going to have to rely on all your other things except for um, your, your menstrual status. So females are actually really lucky because we have this sort of barometer of our hormone health. So your periods, regular periods, say you have healthy hormones. So it's really, really important. And it's just as you're kind of going down the line with patients that may be having reds, you have to really sort of emphasize that the periods is really important. So that's the kind of the, the difficult menstrual, menstrual thing to, to, to delve into. Now, you've got to ask about men. They don't have a period. So uh, um, it's also some quite awkward questions you have to ask men about it. So it's a lot more difficult in regards to males, in regards to knowing if they've got low testosterone. But one of your classic sort of things is, you know, erectile function in the morning, their sex drive, their libido, ask you a little bit of things about, about that. Um, that's sort of a bit of an indication about low testosterone in regards to that area. So again, it's a little bit awkward. Mm -hmm. So once you've done that first bombshell of fun things to be asking about, <laughs> I'll, then, I'll then probably delve back to something that maybe makes them feel a bit more comfortable. So talk about their training. They're going to want to tell you all about that. So, you know, find out a bit about their training. You know, they might actually be doing a training error. They might be having, you know, you know, footwear errors, you know, surface errors. They might have increased their load too much. There might actually be a mechanical reason to their injury. So it's just underpinning underpinning that. Um, and if they're always on the bike, for example, a non-weight bearing sport, are they doing any strength and conditioning for, for bone health reasons, for, you know, tendon loading, et cetera? So find out about, about their injury history, um, their training history. And also kind of find out a little bit about are they having rest days? That's really, I think, important. And then that's, again, where you're going to sort of be a bit clever and a bit savvy about your questioning. Because if they're not having rest days, why are they not having rest days? Is that because they maybe have an exercise addiction? And I think a lot of the time, this is something that's a little bit understated, particularly with eating disorders, which is on this sort of spectrum, is the, the prevalence of exercise addiction. And talking about their training, you might start to see maybe obsessive behaviors with their with their exercise so you've then got to maybe dig a little bit deeper with asking those questions so maybe ask okay when you when you're injured do you still train for injuries do you train when you have a cold um how many rest days do you have how do you feel if you can't get to training do you feel anxious about it and then if we see if they've come into clinic and you can tell that they're still hammering through training for me that's something that i'll probably be a little bit worried about and you can tell by your response of if you tell them to back off, sort of how they feel about that. So that's the sort of things to look out for. So delving now into maybe another area that's a bit difficult to approach is looking at sort of asking about maybe nutrition. So at the moment, you know, all the sort of day and age, it's very, you know, a lot of, lot of kind of nutritional ways people are following. So a lot of people are following quite restrictive diets at the moment. So just find out a little bit about are they following any of that? Because a lot of these people, it might be completely accidental while they're in an energy deficit. If they're a triathlete and they're, you know, working full time and they're commuting to work, some people are really unaware of how much fuel they need to get in. And particularly maybe if they are vegan or something, it's actually really difficult to get that sort of nutrition right. So it might just be complete sort of ignorance. So find out, are they vegan? Are they keto? Are they following a low carb diet? Are they gluten free? What, whatever it may be, because that might be sort of jumping out maybe where they need to be looking at areas to improve on. You then might want to sort of look a little bit, maybe touch on about weight loss. But the way that I would probably describe it is how is your weight steady at the moment that's probably how i would do it and maybe has there been a history of weight loss potentially um so sudden weight loss potentially could be something that you want to maybe look out for and it's just sort of getting the feel about when you start to approach that sort of how they respond to that are they quite defensive they might shut you down straight straight away but i think what's really important with you know sort of our professions is that actually we spend quite a lot of time with our patients so this might not be on your first sort of appointment that you delve into all of it. You might actually just get a feel for it. And it might be sort of, if you build that report, you might question a little bit more about these things as they sort of get to know you and they open up a little bit. Um, but that's sort of the things that I would, be, I would be questioning. And it is really difficult things to discuss, but I think it's really, really important to be having these conversations, even if they shut you down and they're not honest with you, it will still make them maybe think about it. So, my, with myself and my story, my, I remember the first kind of 
time I was maybe confronted about my issues was by a physio and I was very defensive, shut it down straight away. And I kind of wish that maybe at that time they had pushed a little bit more about maybe what I was doing. Um, so it, it's really, really important. And if you're that first person, you know, I think as podiatrists, as physios, often we're like the gateway to healthcare and we could be that first person that might be flagging this. Um, and I think we're really important in sort of that initial recognition of rights because they often come to, you know, come to see us as that first point of call. Actually, Anna, just, just on that um, point about uh, approaching the sensitive questions and, and obviously for a male, this is a bit more difficult, but th the approach that I've always taken is to make sure they understand in advance why I'm going to ask these questions. Yeah. And, that, and that's what I've found most helpful. I explain to them, well, this is why it's important. Then I go in with the question. And not just in this topic, but any sensitive issue, just as long as they're aware why I need to know this information for, certainly makes it a hell of a lot easier. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just kind of explaining the importance of sort of hormones and the menstrual state, like your menstrual cycle and how much it has an effect on, on, on the body and how it can influence, you know, so much i think that's quite an important explanation yeah. because a lot of people are completely unaware of the importance of the menstrual cycle and how yeah. much it has an effect of us each 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 week hmm. i think what you clearly described there anna was was just a beautiful sort of thorough history taking which you know we all know with every athlete patient that sits in front of us history is is king um we're all very comfortable sitting there asking about training age and training history. And, and they're just the things I think we're comfortable with, perhaps because we've done them the most. And like you say, they're less sensitive and the, the much more prickly areas of, like you say, um, or so on a society level, prickly areas of sex, uh, libido, erections, periods, weight loss. Uh, they're, they're areas that we clearly need to develop ways of becoming more comfortable asking those questions because they are they're, they're fundamental in almost every athlete. Is there a scenario where you wouldn't ask those questions to an athlete or is that part of your that is an athlete history taking that you've just described to us or is it only when you have an inkling that things are are, are sort of um heading that what you, your your mind is going towards reds i think if i'm i'm now beginning to talk about menstrual status with most of my patients not even athletes because i've been having some patients that they very much say that they're much worse leading up to their period. So for me, I'm not going to want to push on their rehab during that phase because their, 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 their pain is worse. They're not feeling as good. So it doesn't make sense for me to do that. So I'm beginning to do it a lot more routinely as I'm gaining more understanding about the effects of the menstrual cycle. So it's something that I will probably be doing a lot, to be honest, with female athletes or just female patients asking me about it. Because I do think, you know, we're realizing more and more at how different females are and our physiology does change on a weekly basis. So that's going to really influence sort of the rehab and where our injury is. So I'm asking that a lot more routinely now. Um, but I think a lot of the time you do get this inkling and I think with reds, it's, it's not one thing that tends to jump out at you as, as, a, as that key thing that's delving you down that sort of route. I think there's a lot of little things that you can put together um, and I think it's, you know, you get someone from a certain sport that they've got a certain injury that they've also got the background of like um, iron deficiency and they've got a, um, a little bit of this and you start to ask about their training and they take no rest days and they're low carb. All these kind of little things just add up and you just sort of know because it's these things that will build up that clinical picture. And that's why it's important to have such a thorough history taking because it's not just one thing. It's these little things that all add up to that that clinical picture. Yeah, makes sense. It fascinates me the way, the way that the not just the answers that you get, but perhaps the way they they are the way they act when they answer, or perhaps yeah. the, the answers they refuse to give you. They're, they're going to be quite enlightening as well. And, and and I think you mentioned it, you touched on how being uh, being sort of having low available energy, being in this deficit isn't always an intentional thing. So I guess we can then tease out, are there psychological overlays here of disordered eating or, or type A personality type overtraining? Or is this just someone who's poorly informed and they've just made errors in the habits? I mean, I guess they're, they're the ones that we want to get because they're easy to sort out. They're <laughs> the ones that are, are good and are quite straightforward. It's the psychological overlay with the kind of 
eating disorders, disordered eating that becomes a bit more challenging. Yeah, and I guess we'll come on to this towards the end about if we are in a clinical position where we have these suspicions, what do we then do? You know, what's our action as a clinician? And I guess our action will depend on which one of those types of athletes or individuals we're dealing with. But before we get there, could we sidestep into your personal story a bit? You very briefly touched on it there about, you know, a physio being the first person who told you and and perhaps if they'd have you, you disregarded it and um could you just let people know I mean I know the backstory but just let people know where you were in time and space I believe you were 26 so were you already a physio uh give us the long uh, I'd love the, the the London Marathon story uh, the, the way that I don't know if even Craig knows this but Anna pretty much finished as first non-elite female at the London Marathon then got her England bear could you just give us the backstory yeah so um I have been running for a, a fairly long time. Um, I started, you know, sort of like late teens. And, you know, as soon as I started started running, I probably started developing issues with eating and stopped having periods pretty much on that, on that, on that sense. And then I wasn't very good when I first started out. I had like a period of injury where I didn't run. And then I think very much as I was training as being a physio, I got back into it. But... I wasn't that great. I just showed up. Um, I was not very well in regards to an eating perspective, but I was still ticking along and managing to show up and run despite having issues of eating. And then I remember I never kind of attributed sort of um, the concept of race weight until a lot further on, which surprises a lot of people. But I remember being at the track once and just hearing this coach say, uh, not, not even to me, it was just to someone else. You know that you'll run well when your mum says you look ill. And I thought, oh, this is a thing. You've got to lose weight to race well. And then I very much began to sort of get very obsessed with numbers and race weight and weekly mileage. I think runners are very obsessed with numbers, particularly how many miles you're running a week. Like, you're not a marathon runner unless you're running 100 miles a week and stuff like that. So that very much fed into my behaviours and I got really obsessed with numbers. And then I qualified as a physio and then I started to really sort of up my mileage. And then I started to actually run better. And then I had probably this two year period of like between 2015 and 2017 where I was running really, really well. And I decided to move up to the marathon and I debuted at 2.45. And this is, you know, off the back of terrible, you know, eating behaviours. Um, and then I decided I was going to really train properly for it. At the time, my current eating sort of faux pas was I'm not, I'm going to limit all my carbohydrates unless I've run X amount of miles that day. Um, but I was running so well and, you know, no one questioned it because, you know, you're supposed to be skinny as a marathon runner. You're supposed to not have periods. You're supposed to run 100 miles a week and never take rest days. That's sort of what you're meant to do. So, because you're right, I was running really, really well. No one was like questioning it. And I was hitting every target my coach gave me. And then the London Marathon, it went so well. And I ran a PB, like 10 minute PB almost. And I, as you said, I did really well in the mass race. I got an England vest. And that race absolutely almost destroyed me. I was so fatigued and I just couldn't recover afterwards. Um, I then obviously had this England vest, which was the six months later. And this is when everything started to become very obvious that things were going wrong. So this is where all the little things started to show up. So first three weeks into my marathon build up, I got this cough and this upper respiratory tract inf infection, and I just couldn't get rid of it. Um, I then got low iron and honestly, I couldn't run an eight minute mile. So I've got to this point here where, you know, I've got all these sort of GI disturbances, I've got low iron, um, I've got, um, you know, reduced immune function, I'm not adapting to training, I was getting dropped on the warm up, you know, marathon pace, I couldn't do at all, I couldn't even do eight minute miling, let alone under six minute miling. And I just wasn't adapting, I was absolutely exhausted. Um, and then I was getting quite depressed, I was so irritable, I was a nightmare to be around with. So all of these things were jumping out. But to me, and I hadn't had a period in eight years by this point. And to me, I was like, well, I've not had a stress fracture. So it's not going to be sort of the female athlete triad. I hadn't even heard of Reds by this point. And I went to see a doctor because my performance was so bad. I went to see a sports medicine doctor and she diagnosed me with low iron. We then sorted this out. 
And I managed to get into some shape for um, Toronto, where I had my England debut. But three weeks beforehand, this doctor kind of had put all the things together and was like, hmm, she's not had a period. She's got low iron. She's probably overtraining. Um, Recognised sort of my dependency on exercise and that I was struggling to take rest days despite how knackered I was. And she referred me for a bone density scan. And I remember like just taking the envelope, didn't even look at it, looked at the envelope sort of maybe a couple hours later. And I was really surprised to see that I had quite impaired bone health and I had quite quite significant osteopenia in my lumbar spine um, and, and my hips actually. So, I just thought, okay, get through Toronto. We'll sort it out once you do that race. Get through your England debut. I've managed to get into some shape for it. So I kind of felt a bit more excited about it. But lo and behold, and this is unfortunately what happens, is that the athlete tends to get to this point where they have like an international vest or they've had this major breakthrough and then everything comes tumbling down. So on my England debut, I actually had a stress fracture of my fibula and I didn't finish the race. So that's heartbreaking to, you know, have your dream come true and not being able to fulfill it because of everything. And I saw a sports medicine consultant and she dark faced me with reds. I was put onto HRT. I was on the same medication as my mother, but which is a bit embarrassing. And um, I then, since then, it's almost that my body has just sort of given up the ghost in the sense that just, string of injuries, not necessarily bony, but a lot of sort of overuse injuries, you know, plantar fasciitis, hamstring tendinopathy, tib post tendinopathy, medial tibial stress syndrome, you name it, I've been having all of those injuries off the back of that. And, you know, low iron recurrently. And it's been very tantalizing in the fact that you kind of feel like you're getting out of it. And then you then, you know, your body breaks down again. And it's almost that you get to this point where your body just sort of goes, no, I'm not doing this anymore. And, you know, I went from that athlete of being 100 miles a week. And at the moment, I can't even, I'm running three times a week without tr just trying to stay injury free. And it was a very long process in regards to the psychological element of it about increasing my training, increasing my nutrition at the same time, and to be able to deal with the same things, to deal with the increase in nutrition psychologically with the training. Unfortunately, I because I didn't get the psychological support early on enough, these things weren't in balance so that's why it sort of took quite a long time to start to get over these things and that's why what will come on to the importance of the mdt and the communication between sort of psychology nutrition the coach sports medicine you know podiatry physio because if not everyone's not singing the same home, home sheet you know we might start ramping training up and actually nutrition and psychology aren't quite there yet yeah let's go there let's go there now um yeah. you know so you know, in your case, we've got an athlete like you sitting in front of us and we're, we, you know, we're suspicious, uh, everything, all the all the puzzle pieces feel like they're joining together in our mind. What do we do as, as the, you know, mostly our biggest audience here is podiatrists. As a podiatrist sitting in clinic, having pieced some of these puzzles together from our beautiful thorough history, what's our next step? What's our actionable sort of, um, sort of take homes? I mean, I think the, the first point of call is, you know, you, you've got to deal with sort of what you've got in front of you. So if they're coming in with an injury, you know, they come to you for that. You're going to have to do a bit of a bit a bit of a bit of that in the initial stages. But I think what's really really important for us, and that's again because we can build up quite a good rapport with our patient because we spend quite a lot of time with them, is that education. You know, start educating them about reds. You know, tell them that this is a thing, um, and that you know the, these are the the health implications. Because some people might be like, okay, cool, health implications. I'm going to sort it out. But then, you know, it might be the performance implications that's going to get the buy-in. So start to just reason with them about maybe what they're doing is detrimental. If they're, say, for example, not got any psychological overlay, then great. They're going to be really, really receptive to that. Then I think the most important bit here, particularly with your ones that maybe are on this kind of spectrum of disordered eating or an eating disorder, is that MDT approach. So, you know, it depends on what access you have. But I would definitely get some sort of registered dietitian or nutritionist involved. That's going to be really, really important. Um, and then potentially, if you have access, some sport, sports medicine physician or, or GP, because I think it's quite important to get some bloods involved just to have a look at what's going on. Because it's also quite important to realize that 
Someone might have amenorrhea and it might not actually be anything to do with reds. So it's important to exclude other medical causes. So I think actually getting a set of bloods from a medical profession is important because, you know, for all we know, they might have polycystic ovary syndrome, so they might be pregnant, they might um, have maybe a pituitary gland, gland tumour, for example. There's other reasons why amenorrhea might be happening. So from a medical perspective, I think it's important to get them involved to exclude those other things. And also, they might have medical complications as well. So they might have reduced iron, anemia. They might actually be quite unwell with this. So I think it's important to have someone from medicine in, involved. I think, you know, you might need a physio. And I actually think a lot of the time trying to get some sort of early psychological involvement is important. Um, and that can be where it can be quite challenging. So if they do have an eating disorder, for example, it's, it's quite difficult to get into those services. Um, so again, that needs to be liaising with the GP. Um, I think coach is really important because, you know, your coach might be blissfully unaware of what's going on. They might actually even be feeding into the cause of it, for example. They might be telling their athlete they need to be losing weight. I think, I don't know if anyone's aware of that Mary Kane story um, from the Nike Oregon project, but she actually filed against Nike about being abused by her coach, Alberta Salazar, for losing weight and resulting in multiple stress fractures and depression and, and feeling suicidal um, from being in this Reds picture. Um, so, you know, speaking to the coach, making sure that training is going to be, you know, in balance with everything, making sure they're on board with the MDT. And then, of course, you want to think about teammates. You know, there might be a training group where there's a bit of a culture of this. And I think I know that in endurance sport, there does tend to be a bit of this culture of you've got to be race weight, you've got to lose weight. And sometimes athletes can be around a lot of people, maybe with eating issues. And they just think that's the norm. And it, trying to maybe underpin if there's any issues with that is, is, is quite important as well. And then if you've got a younger athlete, of course, having the parents involved is going to be really, really vital too. Um, so it's a big MDT approach. And I think what's really important is everyone's on the same page, particularly if someone's got that psychological overlay, because they're going to be really trying to outsmart you. And I think in regards to sort of training and rehab, you've got to be really set on the parameters of what they're allowed to do so for example if you're in the gym you know they're going to go and do like a 40 minute warm-up on the bike unless you say you've got 10 minutes warm-up on the bike you've got to stay in this zone otherwise they'll be doing intervals and all sorts at this heart rate you've got to be really descriptive with some things because they're going to be sneaky and they're going to try and exercise particularly if they have an addiction and push the boundaries as much as they can so you've got to be keeping them pretty on a tight leash um with that sort of monitoring. Sure. Actually, can I just, just a slightly off topic question. The, yeah. the osteoporosis of, of, of the type that you had um, and, and of that, that, what's the long, long-term consequences of that? Is there any? So, I mean, obviously the older you are, the, 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 the more difficulty it is to improve your bone health because you do sort of reach a, a peak bone mass sort of in your 20s and then in your 30s you can sort of have some some adaptation to that but there is a point where it is quite challenging to 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 maintain it or to correct it but it depends how sort of far gone they are the most extreme bone health issues i've been seeing is in your younger athletes who didn't necessarily start that period who had early specialization um and they like your teens are really important for reaching your peak bone mass and it's those ones that sort of were pushing the boundaries a lot in their younger years not starting their periods not getting that sort of estrogen protection early on that are having you know quite extreme z scores of like a very high negative number and that's going to be a lot harder to come back from but we know that if someone has had stress fractures and that they have had they have got reduced bone mineral density um, going on to hormone replacement therapy is quite, can be, we think can be quite a good way to help bone health. But the key thing is the energy availability. And it's about restoring that through, you know, nutrition, making sure that balanced carbohydrates is very, very important. You know, vitamin D, um, calcium, obviously, but then also adaptions to training. And I think what's also important to include in training is weight-bearing exercises. 
And you know, you, you get your elite elite cyclist that is in a non-weight bearing sport. You know, cyclists are sort of conditioned to be like, don't walk, just cycle. And as less steps you can do, the better. And they're not going to be doing any weight bearing activity. And if you sort of combine that with the very common common combination of, you know, restrictive energy intake, mm -hmm. then you've got a recipe for disaster. So for them, actually restoring bone health can be really, really positive with skeletal loading activity so that's a combination of sort of you know your compound lifts back squat you know overhead press um um deadlifts and spinal extension exercises as well and plyometrics multiple direction is a really important osteogenic response and that's sort of that high bone turnover response is doing multiple directional impact activities so that's really important to be including within sort of the rehab and that can have quite positive improvements to bone health. Yeah. Um, and I, I just really quickly wanted to say uh, thank you so much for sharing your story. I want to make sure I we said thank you because it's a personal story. And, and I think the, the thing it, it illustrates to, uh, to me at least is how this happens over a long, long period of time. This isn't necessarily a decision you made. It's it's a combination of where you were in time and space, how your training was going, your behaviours, the psychology involved. The people are like you say the people around you and it, it makes complete sense when clinicians get overwhelmed with an athlete sitting in front of them who like yourself you know sits there at the end of a several year journey and perhaps they, as podiatrists they've been referred to us for a fibular stress fracture or fifth metatarsal stress fracture and their expectation and probably our uh, historical practices have been you are here for a an assessment of your mechanics and we're going to see why this why this tissue, why this bone became overloaded. And what we're now saying to people is, you need to take a vast history, you need to ask some sensitive and prickly questions about libido and periods and weight. You then potentially need to bring in an MDT involving, uh, again, taboo kind of people like mentioning the word psychologists, dietitians, which kind of link into those things. The whole thing can feel horribly overwhelming to, to a clinician. And hopefully what this does, it's not certainly what it does for me, is, is makes me realize based on the way you've discussed it, we don't need to stress about doing all this on the first day. We don't need to ask all these, you know, the first time we meet this person, we haven't, like we say, we don't have a great rapport yet. We don't have a good therapeutic alliance yet. Perhaps we only have 45 minutes, 60 minutes with them. We don't need to ask all these questions, formulate this hypothesis and start making referrals to psychologists and dietitians on day one. Um, I think that's the real message that I get, get from here. And, and the other thing I wanted to sort of, get your take on is is how we should perhaps discuss with them based on your own journey your three-year encounter journey the prognosis like like craig asked you know what, what are the long-term effects but actually what what's you know if someone sort of sits there and they take all this on board and they say to us okay i'm listening i'm on board what does this mean because you know if someone comes to us with an achilles tendinopathy the first question they ask is how many weeks till i can train again so if we're sitting there and we, we're talking about this red s and they're okay okay i'm on board what are we talking i mean Obviously, there are no blanket answers. It's it's individual, but is three years like yourself a, a typical timeline? Um, I think it's very individual, of course, in regards to you know how long they've been in this state. If they've been in it for quite a short period of time, then the habits and the behaviours and probably not going to be as ingrained. So it's going to be easy to sort of get out of that. But if you, <laughs> the, the quickest way out of it is going to be trying to do the complete opposite of how they got into it. So I would say the best, if you wanted someone, if someone was saying, what's the quickest way for me to do this? It would be to stop doing any majority of your training, particularly any intensity. So ideally stop training, do some strength work as your sort of form of training at that point. So kind of reduce, definitely not be doing much aerobic training, nothing intense. Um, really bring down the energy, um, sort of the energy expenditure down through exercise. And then it's about restoring that that energy availability. So it'd be about, you know, eating really, really well and actually being in a bit of an energy surplus. Um, that's the most effective way of doing it. And I think myself included, because I didn't have that psychological support, was stringing it out by sort of half committing to it, by maybe sort of culling down your exercise a little bit, but still training quite hard, not quite there with eating yet, 
it just it just will go on really a lot longer that way and the, the, looking at other athletes and looking at um other people and hearing other stories and seeing the best way it does seem to be that really sort of definitely reducing the intensity because that produces that cortisol effect um is really really important and really trying to minimize as much energy expenditure as possible um and then getting that nutrition right on board that's the quickest way of doing it and kind of going quite extreme about it because if you think about it they're really extreme in their behaviors in regards to their training a, a huge amount they're probably very restrictive with their energy intake so to sort of reverse that you almost need to do the complete opposite and that's probably the quickest way um and i've seen people get better more months rather than years um doing that approach um but it, it's very individualized you know with menstrual regaining your period can take quite a long time but there is no sort of clear cut clear cut kind of time period yeah but i mean these these people they can get back to running that's you know even if yeah. someone says like oh, i'm happy for this to take a year i'll do a thing i say but i will be able to run another marathon that that long-term effect is they can as long as they do things right build back up again they, they can get back to what they love doing they can get back to it and people come back even better you know um, a good friend of mine, she is, you know, an elite level runner, you know, represented Great Britain several times. And she's found that she's performed her very best when she's been having regular periods. She's actually the, a lot heavier than before, as she was very, very skinny in her when she was suffering. And she feels so much better for it. And she was training so much less. I think in endurance sport, we get in our head that we need to be doing so more is more in endurance sport but actually we need to have as athletes this sort of approaches of how little can i do for my what i want to get out of my training i want to do the least amount as possible to get x performance but in endurance sport it seems to not be that approach so i think to have a bit more of a sensible mindset of i'll do the least amount of possible for my my goal is important Perfect. So um, just looking at the time, we're approaching the hour, Craig, my little list in front of me, I wanted to make sure we had covered what Red S or Reds was, how to identify it, the questions to ask in clinic, the uh, the flags, the, the tricky questions and how to ask those tricky questions, then ultimately what the prognosis was and, and, and where to send people and what to do. I feel like we've touched all those. Is there anything else, Craig, you wanted to ask or anything that's come through on the Facebook group? No, no, no questions or just um, comment. Look, I, I've just got, I don't know whether you're familiar with the, the, the theory I, I recall reading, and I apologize if this is wrong, but I think it was George Sheehan about 1990 something. He tried to argue that amenorrhea in athletes was quite a normal thing in, in the absence of other pathology. Um, and he tried to link that back to evolution and that if uh, uh, um in the hunter gatherer societies i don't know whether you're familiar with with those ideas and what you th what your thoughts on them are i mean the the, the, the hunter gatherer theory in regards to basically that that mm. female is not having enough energy to reproduce yeah. so they're going to switch off that system because they're burning so much mm. they're not going to menstruate because they feel that they can't reproduce because there's not enough food to go around. That's sort of the primitive instinct. And we know that some really healthy, very lean athletes that are training 100 miles a week. I think a great example of this is Gwen Jorgensen. She's the um, Olympic marathon champion, current holder for triathlon in Rio. She switched to the marathon. She has had a period every single month, apart from when she was pregnant. And she is very lean she trains 100 miles a week and that is energy in versus energy out so you see actually a lot of elite athletes are very very healthy they're having really regular menstrual menstrual cycles and you know to look at them they look really skinny they you know are training very very hard but they're still having periods so i do that is a unfortunately a myth and we have since proved that okay yeah so i think the take home here is that the loss of a period is never normal no it's it's not and for some reason, GPs in particular, I know in the UK, don't really see it as an issue. But to me, if any other kind of system were to stop working, I think it is something for concern. But 
I don't know, a lot of GPs and a lot of people can resonate with me who have kind of maybe gone to a GP with this issue. They tend to just sort of get sort of um, told that it's not much of a big deal, um, which it, it is because, you know, you've got some young athletes with, you know, Z scores of minus four, which is shocking. And they are having stress fracture, fracture after stress fracture. And those type of people, you know, if that's not addressed, that's going to really affect their overall bone health into later life. Yes, just had a comment up there from someone who, your comments there, Anna, she's also called Anna as well. Yeah. Um, your, your comments appear to resonate with her. Yeah, my unfortunately, it's again, and you have to be quite, um, almost go in with sort of armed with your information and being quite educating them almost about why you need to have some bloods and why actually, this needs needs addressing yeah perfect i think we're just about on the alec i'll, I'll just finish with a little comment I, I i mentioned this before we started the i, I was involved in a, a prevalence of running injury survey with others back in 1981 1982 and i presented the results of that study at a conference it wasn't, wasn't earth shattering it was just prevalence and one thing we found was a higher prevalence of stress fractures in female runners and I distinctly being asked a question at this conference, uh, why do you think that is? And I shrugged my shoulders and said, I have no idea. No one knew back then. And, and to think from where we've come from, from well, well, that was, I, th I think it was 1982 to now, we've come a hell of a long way. <laughs> um, quite yeah. a so thanks so much for that, Anna. I, I mean, it's been, the hour's gone really quickly. It's been very informative. We've had some very positive comments. Um, one in particular, uh, a brutal, brutally honest and very informative account, really useful information. So th thanks so much for giving your time this morning. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks, Anna. It was great.